again. Um, are you going to mention uh, Dries's tablet, uh, Dribble in a Tablet World post? No. Okay. I, no. Go um, for it. Why don't there, you? There, there is a post. Uh, Dries Poitart, the founder and project lead of Drupal, has, uh, he, a few weeks ago, he posted on his, on his website uh, a pretty short post about Drupal in a Tablet World and making Drupal more accessible to mobile devices. The comments are, they're amazing. The comments that, I think there are probably 30 or 40 comments that are really high quality, a really interesting discussion. So if you're going online, check it out. It's B-U-Y-T-A-E-R-T.net, or just do a search for Drupal in a Tablet World. That's, that was one of the inspirations for today's event. Uh, so I'm going to pass this around. Uh, who has not signed this? Okay, I'll start over Great. Here. Thank you. Please. Um, so, since we don't have a projector yet, we'll, we'll probably just dive in. There's a couple people who showed up after we introduced ourselves. This is Tom. Tom Boone. I am um, not a Drupal consultant professionally. I am a law librarian over at Loyola, just down the street. Um, and I've done web development using Drupal for about six years now, um, usually related to um, my job, not always. Um, but I had a problem with a site, you did a mobile site a couple of years ago, and I did it, and that's how I got to be here today. And I'm Rain Bria. I do build Drupal websites professionally, and um, one of those sites was the California Votes, CAVotes.org website, which is an election website uh, put together by the League of Women Voters of California, and that website needed a mobile environment. Um, that was, we put that together for the June 2009 election initially. It was used again for this November election. And um, that was how I built the first mobile site that I built. And actually, Ashok um, helped with some aspects of the site, including one of the band aid aspects that we're going to talk about for uh, working with mobile theme switching, which is uh, caching. So wait until we talk about caching. Love caching. <laughs> um, so conceptually, um, oh, just before you before we get yeah. that, into that, I just wanted to point out that what we're going to talk about today is not having a separate site for the mobile users. Because let me, there's a lot of places out there that have a separate URL for their mobile users, and it's a completely different site that's pulling from the same data. What we're talking about here today is a much more basic way of approaching that, which is theme switching, which is the users still go to the same exact site but they are given a different Drupal theme uh, for the content. So it's the same site, different theme. Yeah. Um, since we don't have the projector yet, it'd be fantastic. Yes? So going down here, you know, if you just said, is it Tom? Yes. Okay. What's the benefit of doing theme switching versus the other It's a lot easier. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have no doubt that if I had the time and the desire that I could create a site that's, you know, two different sites that are pulling from the same data. I personally have never done that, and that would take me a long time to figure out how to do. Um, the, was that? When you're finished. Um, what about the uh, sites that sets the width of the screen and change layout? Yeah. Is that the same idea? Or? It's, um, Sort of. It, that's definitely that's definitely part of what you need to think but, about. But is. yeah, a, a fluid a fluid theme though usually is still still designed to For work a, in yeah. one. It's um, yeah. you're, you're talking about like like if you're talking about like fluid garland. No, what? no, I'm talking about. I don't <coughs> have the right screen for it. Well, well, it's, well, a, um, it's an adaptive theme that senses mm -hmm. the width of your screen and changes the layout even different image patterns. We'll sort of be addressing that a little bit later, um, and also there in the stuff that you'll get, there's a link to a really good list of part articles specifically about that, which might be where you're. Yeah, did you read that? It's called yeah. reflexive layout. Yeah, yeah, um, and that's a really good article to kind of help you think about that. But that is part of thinking conceptually about mobile themes. Um, so, so we'll we'll definitely we'll definitely address that a little bit a little bit later. Um, right, but but for what we're doing here today, though, it's more it's it's even more basic than that in terms of just you've got a desktop theme, you've got a mobile theme, and uh, based on what the user is visiting as their user agent, 
they get served up a different theme, which, um, you know, to reiterate, the advantage of that over you know, something that's, that's more complex theme-wise like that or something that's more complex data-wise like having a separate site is that for, uh, for this, depending on which way you do it, theme switching is just a matter of a couple of modules and, um, and theming. And that's it. Whereas the other concepts usually involve a little bit more work. Um, I, I haven't even dealt with what the, Lee is talking about. The, so. re the responsive theming that, that Lee is talking about, um, as well as the approach that we're showing today, both leave you with the problem that I already mentioned, which is the caching problem. Um, the only prob the only way to build a mobile site and avoid the caching issue, which we will talk about more later, is is to actually make it a, a separate site. Um, that's the only way to really properly get past the caching issue. However, um, the actually creating a mobile theme or making your theme a responsive theme, um, those are, and, and I think it's fair to say that the concepts that we're going to be talking about today are the same concepts as if you're doing a responsive themes. We might as well talk about that right now. Who, who doesn't know what a responsive web layout is? Who's unfamiliar with that? Okay, so um, I don't know if you could hear, hear Lee. Um, she started talking about it a little bit, but the concept with a responsive web layout, and this is conceptually what we're kind of thinking about now, is that uh, the user, you, you can go ahead and give the same idea to the user no matter what screen space they have by changing what you're actually, you know, what fonts you're using, what font size you're using, um, by actually letting the browser uh, identify how does the user have their window open and then allowing the content within that to shift. So let's say by default, your, um, I'm, I'm just going to use the word theme. This is applicable not just to um, Drupal sites, it's applicable to static HTML sites, wh whatever. Uh, but I'm going to use the word theme because we all kind of know what that means. Um, Perhaps by default your theme has your uh, uh, an, a set of images in a grid that's three columns wide. But if the user is like me and likes to have small little browser windows open all over the place, that three columns wide isn't going to be so nice. So I'm going to be scrolling left and right in order to see all those images. Well, a responsive theme will actually identify, oh, the user has made their browser space, uh, their browser window smaller. And so it'll, rather than like just looping things or um, you know, randomly throwing things onto a new line, it'll actually adjust that grid into a two-column grid instead of a three-column grid in order to readjust the interface for the user. Does that make sense? Is that, and so, so that's, yeah. There's a, a floater thing. It's just for Drupal 7, but it kind of was okay. this where it's like you have more screen real estate, the mm -hmm. columns float up. That's when nice. You're not used to it, uh, you can take a look at the theme. I know it's for Drupal 7, but uh, you can tell it in the CSS. Or... Is it called Floater? Yeah, it's called Floater. Okay, that's great. So the Floater theme, which is for Drupal 7, um, actually gives you some degree of a responsive layout. Yeah. You were talking about a grid. Are you, are you talking specifically about a, a grid? No, that was an example. Since I don't have a, a projector, that was an example to try to make it visual. Okay. No, 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 I, <laughs> but it can be, I mean, you might, maybe by default, you, your site shows a big hero image that's, you know, 700 pixels wide. Well, if the users made their screen space a little smaller, you might want to actually adjust that hero image to fit within that screen space. Um, so 500 pixels wide or whatever. So responsive web design allows for that. And this actually even though right now we're talking about the actual desktop experience, not the mobile device experience, conceptually this is still the same thing that you want to be thinking about. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, there's a, a book coming out on this in the spring. Okay. Um, from the, from the uh, same, uh, from, from the Alyssa Park folks. Okay. Um, Great. It's, uh, they, they don't have a publishing date for it. It's spring 2011, <laughs> but it's called Responsive Web Design by the guy who wrote the article that Lee's talking about. The article is fantastic, and the packet that you're going to get actually has a link to it. Yeah, there's, there's um, a couple of uh, examples I can give of uh, websites that are that are using this. Oh, great, um, great. But, but you know, wait for that. Um, 
if you can go ahead and post those as comments on the Drupal Everywhere event post, that would be great. Okay. Yeah. Um, Lee, you had a, another question? Um, that, that's okay. Um, I, I think we, we can come back to this a little bit later if people have more questions. I think that this concept probably makes sense and we might want to move on to thinking more mobily. Uh, but thank you, Lee. Um, so, so bless you. Um, so basically what we've just been talking about is rethinking the, um, rethinking about how the end user actually experiences your site. And we've been thinking, we've been talking about a great term, responsive web design. Well, in, in the mobile world, you're taking that to another level. Um, and you're actually rethinking the purpose of your site. So again, we are, as Tom said, we're talking about taking an existing site. Now some of what we're going to say sounds like building a new site because we're going to be talking about different blocks, different views, things like that. But still, we're, we're conceptually coming at this from using an existing site. Um, so when, once you get into the mobile, uh, thinking about mobile, you're really thinking about why are people coming to your website? When they come to your site from this, it's for a very different reason than when they come to your site from, from this. Um, and so you really, before you start working, you really want to think through that. Um, so since we don't have a projector, if everyone um, who has a computer open, not a mobile device, if you could go to mobile.sunraindev.net, and you should see this. <laughs> um, the reason why we want you to go here is because this is what you're going to be playing with um, today, later today, if you don't have your own site to play with. And right now, it's the dummy site set up for you. It is um, really not designed for a mobile device. And it would be horrible on a mobile device. And in a moment, we'll talk about why. Um, jump in any time you want. But when you when you start thinking about designing for a mobile user, um, first thing you want to think about, yay, projector! Um, <laughs> um, first thing you want to think about for a um, for building your site out, for theming your site for a mobile user, is why are they coming to your site from a mobile device? <coughs> the next thing you want to think about is you want to define your users. What are they trying to do? And, and who are they? What are they doing? Well, the first thing is, the first thing is they're on the go, um, probably. I mean, they might be sitting in a doctor's office or something, but more likely than not, they're in motion in some way. They're paying attention to a million things, not just to your site. So automatically, what does that mean? Well, things have to be much simpler. They have to be quick. They can't necessarily be so flashy. Um, you're, it's much better to have something that's quick and responsive and easy to navigate and ugly than it is to have something that's flashy but confusing. Your users will like your site more the first way, even though it's ugly. Your clients might not, but your users will. Block you for um, that's fine. I can move. Um, so the next thing, the next thing is. More likely than not, if the user is looking at your site from a mobile device, they're trying to quickly get to the content that they want. And the content that they want might be different from the content that they want if they're coming to it from one of these. Uh, for example, they might be looking for your address. Um, in the case of the site that Tom set up, um, which he'll show you more of, the site he set up was for a conference, and it was the actual schedule for the conference. So they're actually going into the site while at the conference to look for where they need to be, uh, which is something that Sandcamp would want this for as well. Uh, where is the where is the event? What room is the event? This particular talk in? Uh, what time is it? And right there on the mobile device, accessing it quickly for the CAVotes.org site. Our assumption was people are going to take their mobile phones into the, the, where they're going to go vote, and they're going to want to look up ballot measures last minute and make sure that, um, that they actually researched it properly before they actually fill out the little form. Um, so, so those are different, you know, really assessing what, why might your user be accessing this. More likely than not, they're trying to access it quickly. 
Um, now, obviously, with the advent of the iPad um, and these other tablet devices that are starting to come out, that's slightly changing. Uh, because now you have people who are in bed and they're looking at a website. Um, you know, they're, they're falling asleep, they want to do some reading about things that they enjoy. Um, please don't change things around. Oh, okay. Can I open your display yes. settings? Yes, yes, here. Sorry. We're going to pause the recording. Uh, yeah, watch out. All right. Um, so, by the way, this is what you will be able to make. This site right here, we have on that uh, on those flash disks. So it's what you'll be able to use when we get to the actual practical component of this. Um, what I do want to say, though, because um, I, I feel like I need to, I created a um, I created a stripped down dummy version of the site from a real client site that I'm working on. Uh, which is here, um, this super, um, anyway, and the reason why I'm letting you know this is just because I'm asking you not to actually just take this code and replicate it exactly, because very soon there will be a live client site that looks like this. Um, so, you know, it'd, it'd be nice if you do use the code, that's fine, uh, but make it look different, make it look like your own site. Um, thank you. All right, I felt like I had to say that, sorry. <laughs> so um, let's, go back to, let's go back to this. So, the, um, so we were talking about defining your users. Why are they there? Um, as Tom said earlier, you might, might want to start thinking about um, having your iPad experience be di or your tablet experience be different from your um, mobile phone experience um, if it, if it can be the same as your standard web experience, that might be the best, but you'll be the one to judge um, how that works. Um, but, you know, another thing, so we were talking about the, um, we were talking about the typing. Typing isn't as great on a mobile device. Um, so some people don't like to type, so you might not need people who are commenting can, can just go to the actual web experience. That'll be up to you. That'll be on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and there's um, something, you know, there's a lot of sites out there that emphasize search over nav, whereas because of sort of the thumb approach to, um, to navigating something on a phone, a lot of times you want to push the emphasis to sort of the, the menus and navigation um, rather than the search functionality. I mean, that's all going to depend upon the site you're doing, but whereas, you know, here on a site like this, we have, you know, menu, 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 um, on a mobile site, whatever menu is actually the main navigation for the site will usually be put front and center, as opposed to what usually happens on, on, uh, on desktop sites where you have a combination of nav and content on the front page. A lot of times, lots of different content uh, put together sort of showcasing what's on the site, and that doesn't necessarily work in a mobile environment. Right. The other thing to think about is, unfortunately, people coming to your site from um, a mobile phone or something, they might be driving. I mean, they might be walking. They might be driving. I hope they're not. I hope you don't do it. But it is a possibility. So that fact is just yet another argument for really thinking big, simple, quick. It's stupid if they're doing it, but you can do as much as possible to make it just a little safer. Does, does anybody here use the website SigAlert.com? Anybody? Yeah. Um, when you go to the site, say you're in your office wanting to know what the drive home is going to be like, what do you, what do you look at uh, on SigAlert.com? You get the map and you've got the mm -hmm. list of uh, freeways on the side and you can kind of select there and right. drill down that way. But the map yeah. is always there. The map is the big thing. You can just look at it and get a sense of green, red, yellow, whatever. Um, who here has used SigAlert.com while they're driving? Anybody? What do you get when you go to SigAlert.com when you're on a, on a phone? Uh, from the beginning, it's the list of the highways, and then they have this nice little, I don't know if it's uh, J2 touch or what it is, but uh, you can drill down each highway then to the list of the exits, Right. and you can kind of see a whole list of the stats of the exits as you scroll through. Right. No map, though. No map. 
Just strictly, you just strictly navigate with your thumb to find which highway you're interested in, and then look at the exits. It gives you a list of exits and shows you what the current speed is at each of those exits. If there's um, an incident somewhere, it'll show up right there, you know, in the list where it would appear as you're driving. So if it's between two certain exits, say you're on the 101, and uh, there's a uh, there's an, there's an accident between uh, Glendale Avenue and the 110. There would be an incident listed in that list right between there. Whereas if you're in your office looking at it on a map, you just get a big map and you see you know something you need to click on to see what it is. So same exact information, but designed to be used in completely different ways depending on who's using it and in what uh, in what particular environment they're using it. Mm -hmm. Um, so the other thing that we're kind of saying without actually saying it, so we will say it, is single column. Um, mobile, designing for a mobile device is a lot more like designing for a screen reader. Um, single column, really big buttons, really easy, clearly marked navigation. Um, so this is probably a good time for each of us to sort of show what we did and why we did it. Um, do you want to start, Tom? Um, I have your slideshow up here. Oh, you do have a slideshow. Yeah. Excellent. Let me just go back to the beginning. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so while this is being worked out, uh, I want to mention Chris Charlton. Thanks for bringing the projector today. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, our projector, the one we were going to use, fell through today. So Chris got this at the last minute. Uh, we had to pay out of pocket for this. If this is a valuable uh, day, um, you can talk with me or talk with Chris. Um, that's it. No obligation, just if you happen to feel yep. like Every you obligation. <laughs> <laughs> well, according to Chris, every obligation. <laughs> so somewhere, somewhere in the middle is two or three dollars. <laughs> All right, so um, I've actually got everything up on slides so I can show you both both the desktop and the mobile versions of what I was doing. Um, and so the, uh, this is a little hard to see, but what, the, what this is, is as a law librarian, I go to a conference every July, uh, AAAL, uh, American Association of Law Libraries. It's the big conference. There's thousands of people there um, every year. And two years ago, um, a lot of us were getting, a lot of us sort of younger people in the profession were getting frustrated because AAAL was only publishing their program content uh, in PDF format. If you wanted to know what the schedule was for the conference, you went to their website and you had to download a 50-page PDF of the actual program that you would be handed when you got to the conference. Only way to be able to navigate and see what the schedule was. So, being the anti-authoritarian type of person, passive-aggressive anti-authoritarian person that I am, um, I decided to, without asking anybody, just build my own version of the program and put it online. My thought being, if I do it, they see it, maybe they'll start doing this from now on. Um, so I started out and put the schedule online. That's, that's the first thing I did was I just want to put the schedule online. I put schedule online, CCK, date, and all these various fields uh, and displaying the program. Um, and ultimately, the question was asked, well, if it's there in a Drupal site, why not make it so that people can build their own schedule, can go through and look at the program, select what they want to go to, and then have their own display of their own schedule? Okay, that sounds fun. So decided to do that. Next question after that was, okay, we got all these people in here with their schedules. Why shouldn't I be able, if somebody else wants me to be able to see their schedule, why shouldn't I be able to see all of my colleagues' schedules? So I know where I can find somebody, or I know what my friends are attending. And so created this thing where people were sharing their schedules online. It eventually even made it possible for people to add their own personal events that only they could see. Um, so in the three or four months leading up to the conference, this is all well and good. People are using it. Um, I think we had about 500 users at its peak. And as it got closer to the conference, the question was, okay, what are people going to do when they actually get to the conference? Are they going to print these things out? Kind of defeats the purpose. They might as well just have a big... Uh, big program that they get handed and they just circle everything. So about a week before the conference, I decided I need a mobile version of the site. Uh, because if you go to... Oh. <laughs> Sorry. 
If you go to the website on a phone, and this is just this, I'm an iPhone user, so this is just a shot for my iPhone, you get that same exact website in the phone, in the browser, and everything is tiny, um, and not everything works. Because, like, for example, the, the search um, was a module that no longer is uh, uh, current, but I think it was Auto Node Finder, so that you start typing and it starts and it shows you a list of uh, matching nodes. Um, got all this extra stuff. I had, you know, I had links to the official conference website. I had links to um, the RSS and Twitter and Facebook feeds. I had just a picture to make it pretty. All that stuff is just cluttering up the mobile experience. I needed something a lot more well-defined. And so what I did was just completely knock everything out. <clears throat> Somebody is coming to the site. They want to do two things. They want to either log in and get access to their own content and see who they, what they've saved, or they want to uh, view the entire schedule. So you can view the entire schedule without logging in. Um, I changed the login form, uh, just basically rethemed the login forms logged in. They just get a menu. That's it. Title, menu, disclaimer. That's it. That's all I wanted to do. And so as you go through the various uh, parts of the site, um, on the desktop version, you have a list of your own personal schedule. The way that it looks in the uh, desktop version, much more simplified uh, for the uh, for the iPhone version, the the mobile version. But you don't really lose any functionality. Um, if I'm looking at the desktop of a program description, this is what an actual event page looks like uh, on the desktop uh, version. Same exact content in the uh, mobile version but all in that single column format. I just scroll down, get rid of all the sidebars, uh, simplify the navigation. The list of the full schedule, the way that it looks in the desktop. Whereas if you go to the full schedule on the mobile, you actually have to select which day you want to look at, um, which makes it, you know, makes it avoid having to pull up this massive long list of basically seven days worth of events. Um, you can pare it down and save how much bandwidth you're using, how, how things load. When you've saved other people's schedules, you get this sort of nice grid layout that, uh, with pretty pictures when you're looking at things on the uh, uh, desktop. Much more simple, but you still get their name, who they work for, and a link that you can just tap to go to their profile. Profile on the uh, desktop page has their schedule, their information, their photo. All of that's still there but we get rid of the floating photo and just go to the single column layout. Here you go. Go to the single content layout. You still have the ability to click on, uh, you know, to go through any of these links. You can still remove that person from your save schedules. When you're looking at an event, you still have the ability to add it or remove it from your events. Um, Schedule is still still there to browse through. Same exact concept with the ability to find various people on the site that you want to see their schedule and save their schedule. Going to the mobile version, it looks just like the save schedule list, just a name and who they work for. So the idea was to pretty much have all of the same content, the same functionality as what people were used to in the desktop environment that they had been using building their schedules in the months leading up to the conference. But by doing it in this mobile format that changes the navigation considerably, still wanted to make it as intuitive as possible, but to tailor it for the more stripped down uh, basics of the mobile experience. So that's what uh, I was able to accomplish. Um. So I'm just going to show you a completely different site, and it's um, I won't go into as much depth because I think you really get the the point. Um, let's see. I understand that if I stand there, then I, I block the view. So I'm going to sit down. Is that okay? All right. Great. Okay. Um, so we're actually going to look at uh, where did it go? Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, 
big, so big. All right, so this is actually a, um, this is a, a local version of the cavotes.org website. Um, and you can see that looking at it here, you, you can just see automatically how horrible this would be in a mobile environment. Um, it would be truly awful. And what we really identified is that most of the people coming to the site would actually be coming to look for ballot information during an active election. Um, oh, right, because there's no actual, I put this here just to give me a quick link to it, but since there's no active election right now. Okay, so here's the June 8th election. Um, and when you, when you actually come to the election page, you also get any seats up for contests that have been added. Um, you get any announcements related to the election. You get any measures that are on the ballot, and you can actually take a look at those measures. Again, terrible, terrible, terrible interface for the mobile experience. Um, definitely designed for a web experience. If you click on a particular ballot measure, um, then you have a lot more than you need. It's a less horrifying experience for the mobile environment, but it's still pretty horrible because you don't need these sidebars. And what you're trying to do is just get this text, right? So what, uh, what we did, um, I think. all right, here we go. Um, I've just shaped this like the iPhone. This is the, this is the same site just with the mobile theme. And there is, by the way, um, theme switch, or switch theme. I keep calling it theme switch. Switch theme is in use on both of these versions. Um, up here, you can actually switch to it right up here. And then on the uh, mobile version, you can switch back to the web optimized version right here very easily. Uh, we did keep the search functionality because that's something that users might want to do. Again, there's no active election right now, but when there is an active election, that's the first thing that comes up right here. Um, so the June, in that case, it would be the June 8th election, right here, right up at the top, because that's most likely what people are coming for. Uh, we can still get to it by going to upcoming elections. Again, just a list of stuff, um, just a quick list. And then um, you have the measures that are on the ballot. And if you actually go to one of those measures, now you have the content with no sidebars, just pure content. And you can continue to get more if you want, if you want to go more in depth. Most people just want the quick facts. They don't want the more information. But you can actually go ahead and get, um, I think this particular one has an enormous amount of content. Well, that's not terrible. But just to give you a sense of just how deep you can go, um, in the mobile environment without seeing stuff that you don't want to see. We also kept the breadcrumbs here just to make it easy to go back. Um, I like what Tom did in that he made the buttons a lot bigger than we did. Um, so, you know, I definitely think about that next time doing a mobile theme. Um, but this one is obviously focused more on the ballot measures than on anything else. So this is just a different context for the same concept. Um, and going from there. Um, before we move on, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. The link at the top there, uh, to go back to the other web experience, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, is that it, is, do you put that in the top of your HTML? Mm -hmm. Is that where that resides? Yes. And then my other question is the port that they're using. Um, is, is that for their mobile experience? Oh, this, this mm -hmm. port right here? Yeah. It, That's my local okay. setup, yeah. Yeah. Can, can you repeat the questions for the recording? Um, that's a good point. So the, the questions were um, this link up at the top where it says view the web optimized version of cavotes.org. Was it in the TPL file? And yes, it is. It's hard coded into the TPL file. Um, and the other question was about this, this port right here, um, whether or not that was for the mobile experience. And actually, it's my local um, MAMP port. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. depending on, on, uh, on what uh, particular module setup you're using, whether it's switch theme or mobile tools, there will also be uh, blocks that you can add to a theme that will um, provide a link for switching between 
between themes. Right. Um, so, is it, uh, so you can do the hard coding TPL or the um, end user friendly. They're right, very and, friendly and you, for us. And you end up but... having to do just as much, if not more, <laughs> hard coding on the TPL for the block as you would just to add the link into your right. page TPL. Right. Um, so, so that are there any other questions? Yeah. No. So the question is, is this only a user-initiated switch or is it automated? And it is automated using mobile tools in this particular case. Um, the tool that Tom used was BrowseCap? BrowseCap with Switch with Theme. Swi with Switch Theme. Switch Theme is what, is what I'm using for the link. Um, and I'm using mobile tools to have the user agent identified automatically and then switch the user to the proper theme based on where they come from. Um, Tom is using BrowseCap as the user agent identifier. And you can actually use BrowseCap with mobile tools to get even more functionality. And there's even um, another option, which is Werfel, I believe is what it's called, mm -hmm. which I've never used. And I don't I think you've either. used either. But it's another alternative to BrowseCap because I think Werfel actually focuses, actually looks at both uh, the browser and OS. Uh, so it's a much, a much bigger uh, a much bigger library. One of the reasons why I never got around to using it. Yeah. Are these uh, Drupal modules or are these yes. libraries for Yeah, yeah. both. Because okay. um, uh, with, with the BrowseCap module, you install BrowseCap and then it has an interface where you refresh the library, which then goes and pull it, pulls it from the external library. Uh, with Werfel, part of the installation is the, of the Werfel module is that you then have to place a library um, into your um, into your uh, uh, your your code setup, and it then uh, will do an. It also does an auto download, which is a much bigger library download than what BrowseCap was. BrowseCap just focuses on. It, it will actually look at both both agents, both the OS and the browser, but um, will just display a single option. So even though iPhones and iPad and iPhone touches iPad, iPod Touch, <laughs> all identify as mobile Safari. They identify with a different OS, um, you know, what, what the actual uh, device the person is using. And BrowseCap will show them as three different agents, even though they're the same browser. So uh, Werfel, like I said, I've never used it because I got sick of waiting for the library to download. Um, mobile Tools also has a library built into it mm -hmm. as well. So there's no shortage of options for having a library that will capture the user agent and respond uh, based on what they're coming from. Yeah. For those who uh, are not on IRC, several of us are in the Drupal-LA channel, and we will post links in real time to these Drupal project pages. Uh, if anyone needs help with IRC, go to groups.drupal.org slash LA and click I'll put the wireless password in the RC channel too, but that won't, that won't help you. <laughs> <laughs> we're at capacity. We might be at capacity, yeah. Okay. I got kicked off a second ago. Yeah, so, yeah as, as did I. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. But also, for those who can get online, if you want to join us in IRC, uh, go to groups.drupal.org slash LA. Click on the glossary tab and scroll down to IRC. There's a link there that will open the IRC channel in your web browser. And there's all the information in there if you have your own IRC client. And I'll post the link to that in the IRC's channel. Right. And we, we will actually be getting a little more in-depth into these individual modules yeah. and how you set them up and play with them uh, shortly. Yeah. Uh, are you guys going to be talking more about, the, about these two sites? Yeah, uh, these, the, yes. um, these two? Probably a little bit, but we're we're going to move more into the mobile, the the lovely mobile site. <laughs> I had an aggressive uh, marketing campaign for mine, sort of grassroots. I had a Twitter feed for it that had plenty of followers. I think I, it had 80 fans on Facebook, um, and I was using those to push out whenever a new event was added. It would automatically post to Twitter, automatically post to Facebook if there was a new event. Um, 
But one of the cool things at the conference was how many times where I'd be in this massive presentation room uh, in the convention center, and somebody across the room would and hold up their phone to show me that they had it loaded. So it was very popular. I didn't do it this past year because uh, the organization actually contracted with uh, someone much more expensive than me to do um, a, uh, a, uh, a, a personal scheduling thing. With, with, with what they used was sched.org, which is uh, used on South by Southwest, you, does it. Um, and, and so since they were doing that, I decided not to do it and got lots of people who were sad because they liked mine better. <laughs> um, as for CA votes, there are a lot of people who responded very positively, but um, what is important to note is I'm not sure how to take that feedback because what the League had before this was about 10 years old and um, was really terrible. And in fact, they still have that, um, that site up for their advocacy stuff because this, um, this site was only funded by education, so it couldn't have any advocacy on it. Um, so, by comparison, this is just significant improvement. So, hopefully, they were right, they were honest that they love it, but the league was very happy to have it. Um, so, and they they want more. They they keep asking for more. So, <laughs> so that's good, right? Just, um, just a few sort of big picture things to mention before we get into the nuts and bolts of how to put these modules together. Because uh, what because they, like I said the approach we used were, were two different approaches actually that accomplished the same thing. Um, so we said before, but just want to reiterate. Um, oh, forget this even better. Um, Flash. Uh, lots of things out there for desktop sites use Flash. Uh, Android, as I understand it, likes Flash. iPhone doesn't. It's just not an option. Um, so if you have flash-based content uh, and you ha and you want to actually have something that iPhone users can use, you, you have to ditch the flash and go with something else. Um, Other widgets might not work. Um, the, the reason why I put this annoying Funkadelic clock on the site was just to show you a, the site that you're going to play with was just to have a, an annoying widget that really doesn't belong in the mobile environment on the site, um, so it's an example of something that you're, if that functionality is important to the mobile recipient, then find another way to give it to them. Um, Superfish or suckerfish menus can be very difficult in uh, a mobile environment uh, where someone is, uh, you know, is basically tapping on things where everything in a mobile environment sort of works like a hyperlink. You tap it and it does something. Whereas uh, you don't get to hover over things in a mobile environment and there, I've got, I've been able to get those drop-down menus to uh, to load in various situations. I couldn't tell you how I've done it. I don't know if I held on to the the button for a longer time and eventually just showed up. Or, but but the, the the point is, um, they can be difficult to use, and they might not work, or they might might what 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 might happen is if they want to get that drop-down menu, they won't know that there's a drop-down menu for one thing. They'll just see a menu item. And as they tap the top one, it might actually display the drop-down menu right for a split second before it takes them to the next page, uh, which can be disorienting and uh, might tick them off because they didn't even know that there was a menu there and they can't use it anyway. So you might want to stay away from the drop-down menus. Uh, some things will actually, bless you, some things will actually open other applications in the mobile environment, uh, Google Map. Um, Sometimes you can have your phone numbers actually be active phone numbers. The user can click on it and make a call. Email addresses um, are also clickable. These things open other apps on the mobile device. So you'll want to keep in mind when you put these kinds of things into your, um, your mobile experience that the user is leaving your site and, in fact, the, their mobile browser entirely when they click on those tools. Um, which is not necessarily a bad thing. That's actually really what they're designed for. But you definitely want to be aware that that's what's happening. Uh, big fonts are your friend, um, <laughs> especially for nav items, things that are clickable. Uh, because if there's just this little tiny bit of text they're supposed to tap on, uh, I can't tell you the number of times where I've been navigating in a desktop site on my iPhone, and it will take me three or four tries to click the right link 
when I've got multiple links stacked together. Um, and I'll have to tap something, stop it, or go back, tap it again, and it can get very frustrating. So you make the font size bigger, you give it more white space around it so that when someone is tapping something, they know exactly what they're tapping and they can't accidentally tap something else because some of us have very fat thumbs, people have fat fingers. Uh, it's just a reality when you're talking about moving from a keyboard, a real keyboard that's large and luxurious into that tiny phone, you need to be able to compensate for uh, people using their thumbs. Um, along similar lines, mixing um, your definitions for font sizes, some people like to use um, font sizes that are percentages of the default um, of the base font. Uh, some people use EM instead of uh, point. Some people use point. Um, it's all well and good to use any one of those, but try not to mix them with each other because when you get into the mobile environment, your base font size is going to be different. So if you're using a percentage, you know, if you have 110%, uh, for one thing, and then point size 14 for another thing, and those ultimately look about the same on your web experience. On your phone experience, you could suddenly have the point size 14 being enormous and the 110 being really, really small. An, so. an example of where this happens is this is uh, you can't really tell what it says, but you, hopefully you can tell the difference is that this text here is much smaller than this text here. On the desktop site, they're the same size. I didn't plan for that that bottom block to be. Um, Oops. I meant to go back there. Yeah, on the desktop site, this and this are the exact same size font. I wanted them to be the exact same size font, but on the mobile experience, that's not the way that it played out because obviously I didn't use the same type of font size definitions for each, and it burned me on the. Granted, it didn't burn me because I switched. I just switched the theme. But if I had wanted to use this on a um, on the uh, mobile experience, it would have thrown everything off for people because it wouldn't have acted the way that I intended for it to act. Um, the other things, and you'll actually have this. It's it's both online and in the packet that will give you um, to to work on hacking out your own theme. Um, this list is here. Um, so quick and simple, better than fancy, even if it's ugly when it's quick and simple. And then just a little thing, this hasn't actually burned me yet, and Tom, you said it didn't burn you yet, but um, I expect someday it will. Try not to use display none as a hack in your CSS. And display none is something you want to avoid anyway, because <laughs> uh, even if it says display none, it's still loading in the HTML, which means that... Um, it's there to be seen by anyone who wants to, to uh, tweak the CSS or look at or view the source, and Google is picking it up as well. Just because it has display none does not mean the search engines, when they're uh, spidering the site, are not picking up anything that had, that shows up in the display none. Um, so, as always, try to avoid that if at all possible. Yeah. Um, and then there's just some links here. The links um, are to the Drupal.org contributed mobile themes. Um, link to the Drupal.org book page on using mobile tools, which is helpful. Um, and then two links to um, a list of part, one being the responsive web design article, which is really good if you're interested in that. And then the other one being a return of the mobile style sheet. Um, so list of part is just always wonderful. Um, one last point. Um, the quick and simple will provide a far better user experience than fancy. That doesn't mean necessarily that you cut off functionality in your site. Um, the idea of a mobile site is that maybe it's functionality that appears uh, across a single page in a desktop version might appear on multiple pages in uh, a mobile environment. But you don't necessarily want to cut your users off from functionality that they expect. Um, one of the things that I've always found frustrating with Twitter, and they may, they may have fixed this by now, but for a long time on Twitter's mobile um, display, when you pull up someone's profile and, so their, and their stream, it didn't display their bio. Um, and a lot of times what would happen is, I, you know, before I get to work, I'm at home, uh, I might even still be laying in bed, I'll see somebody new is following me, and before Twitter had the, uh, had that, uh, um, uh, had the bio in the email, I didn't know who it was, I didn't know whether I wanted to follow them. So I might, on my phone, tap the link to their profile, it shows up in the 
mobile display, and I still don't know who the hell they are because while well, there's a picture, there's no bio. So I had to switch to the desktop theme on my phone in order to view that person's bio. Uh, something else that Twitter used to do, don't know what they do now, is they had a different word for followers uh, and people following on their mobile site. It listed friends. I still to this day have no idea what Twitter meant by friends. I don't know if that meant people that follow them or people they follow. I have no clue what that meant. But because, but, because if you go on to the desktop version of Twitter, the word friend is nowhere to be found. Friend is a Facebook concept when you're talking about social media, not Twitter. I believe those are people that are both following one another. But you're absolutely right. There's no, there's no analog to the, to the desktop right. full version. Right. So uh, the, the idea being is that, you know, like say, one thing that I did eliminate from my mobile site on the scheduling site that I wish that I hadn't is the ability to sign up for the thing in the first place. The way that it's set up, the only way that you can register as a user uh, was to go to the, uh, the desktop site. Uh, my thinking was, by the, probably because I did it so late in the game, anybody who was going to use it was already using it, but um, if I could go back and do it again, I would have tried to find a way to add the registration part into the mobile site, just so that I'm not cutting off my mobile users from any functionality. Is there a way to scroll? On the mobile device? Yeah. So it would translate whatever you call on the website page to a window it has on the mobile um, You could probably do that with a, a theme um, using something like QuickTouch or something, but that would complicate the user. Yeah, the, the question for the recording was whether or not was whether or not there's an easy way to translate for mobile users the things that would be multiple columns into separate pages. Is that what you're saying? To easily have it automatically translate uh, those columns into separate pages. Um, yeah. And Rain said possibly with something like Quick Tabs. I don't know of anything, but it's not something I've investigated at all. So maybe someone else has a has an idea for that. Stefano, were you just catching me for not? Yes. Also, please be sure to speak into your mic. We'll project louder because if Great. I get closer, I, I block people. <laughs> so um, there are a couple other a couple other tips that aren't in here. Um, just want to make sure that we don't miss them. Um, so mobile tools. If mobile tools is the way that you go, um, and we're about to show some of these modules. Um, but if you end up choosing mobile tools, mobile tools actually allows you to create mobile user roles. Um, so for those of you who have built enough Drupal sites with different types of user roles on your site, you can get a sense of, of how this would be useful. Um, if you do actually want to provide different experience um, or set different permissions for the mm -hmm. mobile experience, you can do that using mobile tools without having to somehow find a way to create multiple roles because mobile tools will automatically do that. And I'll show you that. Um, does, is anyone confused by what I just said? Would, would anyone like me to try to rephrase that? No? Okay, great. Um, and then um, another nice thing is, um, well, not another nice thing, another really important thing that goes with everything that we've been saying up to this point is when you're creating a mobile version of your site, because you're using a different theme, um, you're actually then looking at the ability to have different views, different blocks. Um, you're also, you know, if you're using panels, you could use different panels. Um, so really thinking, what are the views that you want? What are the blocks that you want? And what are the uh, user roles that you want in the mobile experience before you start building it out, before you start theming it? Um, you know, really, well, both building it, configuring it, and theming it, really think about these things, um, because that way your user experience will be a really good one instead of something that you just kind of put together. Right, and because, and because as Rain said, you're talking about doing a completely different theme, you get all of the options that come with a different theme. And the big thing for me was the ability to use blocks and use completely different blocks. Or regions. Uh, yes, or completely different regions. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, I, mean, I think basically you know, what my site, my mobile site ended up being was basically only three or four regions that were just stacked there. You know, it wasn't uh, you know, any different columns, things like that. But um, the, the nav that I built for the mobile site were all menu blocks that I don't use anywhere on my desktop site. 
Um, they were completely separate blocks that I built just for the, uh, the mobile experience. I don't use primary links or secondary links on my mobile site. I use completely different menus that I built and don't use uh, on the desktop. So. And that's true for me as well. I did exactly the same thing, um, which is good to know. So, you want to dive into actually? Yeah, it's that, it up? And, and you're up. Um, All right. I, I have nothing enabled, um, but I do have, if you want to use Drush, the only thing is to do it quicker. If you want to here. do any sort of talking while I'm logging in because I have a really long password that I have to look up. Okay. <laughs> to get in. Um, oh, well, you could use this one too if you want. Or were you going to use your site? I was going to use my site. Oh, okay, great. Great. Okay. So um, let's see. What shall I talk about? Are there any other questions or anything that you'd like to expand on? Any points anyone wants to make? Anything anyone disagrees with? Okay, awesome. <laughs> um, I don't agree that there aren't disagreements. <laughs> yes? What, uh, what's your perspective of the future as far as um, ads and so forth? Because I see the biggest difference between the desktop experience and mobile experience that you're showing here is that as a SEO, I would like the desktop experience, and I would hate the the mobile experience because uh, you, know, you don't have the links that you would normally be making money on your desktop. Okay, that's a good question. The question here, oh, it looks like I'm not online anymore. Um, the question that was just asked is for a perspective on. Um, on a perspective on ads in the mobile environment, and um, you know, saying as a. Um, oh, thank you. We're getting a, a different network for us. Um, so, if you're um, if you're trying to produce money um, using ad links on your site, um, where do those fit in in the mobile environment? How do you how do you handle that? And that's actually, I mean, if you want those ad links, I think both of the sites that we showed are not ad link oriented, which is why they're not there. Um, the, educate, the League of Women Voters of California Education Fund can't legally have ads on their site. So there won't, they won't be there. And in, and in the case of Tom's site, uh, there's no real purpose for, um, for ads because it's for a very specific audience. But if you want to put ads into your user experience, um, you can certainly do that. You'll just figure out where to place them. Maybe up at the top, they'll be smaller. You'll be looking at, you know, maybe 120 pixels wide and 50 pixels high. So you could put it right up at the top. You'll also have to remember not to use Flash as your, um, as your source code. So there's a lot of Flash ads out there if you're pulling them in from an ad server of some sort. Um, so you'll need to find source that isn't Flash-based for any ads that you're trying to generate money off of. And it would be better to think about, you know, something text-based, very little text, um, you know, more like the, the log line for a movie than the synopsis for a movie, um, that, that kind of thing. Do you have a... Yeah, the network's back up, everyone, but uh, it doesn't have, like, people have their emails open or anything that's not necessary for the network. Just respect that because that's why it's going down. So you're just getting overloaded. HTTP requests. Thank you. We're probably the biggest culprits right here, though. <laughs> But thank you. Uh, yes? Question. Oh, just in general, um, you set up a Drupal site and someone wants the mobile piece of it. Is that a small, medium, or large effort compared to the Drupal site? It's really going to depend on the circumstances. What is it that the client needs? What does the mobile site need to be? It's, I think it's just like any other Drupal site. It's, it, you, you need to know all the other parameters to know. Um, it's really easy to set up a simple mobile site. Um, I think I did, well, Tom did the his in less than a week. I did mine in, a, a, I think, a day. Um, I mean, there were some CSS tweaks that I spent um, a little more time doing just to make it look a little better. But it, uh, you can do it really quickly. Uh, the hardest part, I think, is really identifying what that mobile environment needs to be for the end user. So looking back more at project management and, um, and wireframing before actually going in and doing it, because some of the stuff that Tom's going to show you right now, um, it's just really quick and easy to put in mobile tools or browse cap or uh, switch theme. I keep saying 
theme switch. Um, it's really easy to put one of those in. It's really easy to add a new theme. And if you don't spend any time adjusting your theme, then you're just moving blocks around or creating new blocks. That's so. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, if they want more, obviously that's it. But if they just want a simple mobile interface, yeah. that's simple. Yeah. It's, it's so easy to do that, you know, on some level, that, that we should all be doing it. Now, I've only done it on one site, so I shouldn't say that, but, but we should all be doing it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And we will get to those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because cause, cause most of my weekend was spent not dealing with theming or getting the... Actually, it was, it was uh, spent trying different approaches, but only because I was running into the same performance issue on all approaches. And so eventually I was dealing only with, with performance issues. Uh, but the actual setup of the modules was easy. Which, yeah. uh, before I get started, do you have, you have a yeah. question right there? You know, you... Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Good point. And uh, we should be repeating them for yeah. this as well. Uh, so the last question was whether or not we had run into any performance issues. We both used different approaches. And did we run into any performance issues? And yes, we did, and we will talk about those. Um, although, interestingly, I think our performance issues, even though we used two different approaches, were exactly the same. Yes. Our solutions were different, but, but the issues were exactly the same, um, which is an issue that I think this method will always hit um, no matter what. And there might be a solution that somebody knows about. If they do, we'd love to hear it. Right. So, um, so my setup um, was using a combination of switch theme and browse cap, just two modules. Now, I, of course, there was had to do a mobile theme as well, but in terms of what modules I needed to... Uh, to switch users between, you know, for, to the appropriate theme, which is browse cap and switch theme. Uh, neither of those are designed specifically only for uh, mobile experience. Switch theme is simply a module that allows users to switch the theme. Um, one, one way to do that is to actually have a link or a block where a user gets to select which theme that they want to use. So an example might be if you are a theme designer, you might have, uh, you might use switch theme to allow people to view a dummy site in all the various themes that you design and offer for people to use. Uh, switch theme, however, does allow for integration with BrowseCap, which as I mentioned before is a module that captures the user agent of people visiting your site, and then what switch theme will do is serve up a different theme based upon which user agent uh, the person is using. So let me get out of the way over here as I show you the setup for those two things. The first one is you have to have um, your library set up with BrowseCap and so in the site config menu there is a configuration page for BrowseCap which the only options you have available when it loads is basically the ability to tell it to monitor browsers, which uh, what BrowseCap means is browser capture. Um, and so you turn on monitor browsers. You also hear it says BrowseCap data current as of 4566. That's the last library update. Um, there's a button there to refresh. I refreshed it last night, so hopefully uh, it's the same library that, that's current. Um, but that's it. That's the only BrowseCap things, you know, options you have there. BrowseCap doesn't do anything except capture the, the, uh, the browser and then some other module has to make use of what it captures. So the other module to tweak then is Switch Theme. And in Switch Theme, the, ver the first option is the Themes tab where you tell it, you, it, it has all of the enabled uh, themes that you have on your site currently, and then you can give it a more friendly name. Uh, that The only functionality that provides comes up over here once you get into the browser tab, or if you were using that block where people can manually switch a theme, this name here is what would display in the block, not the machine name. So, so you know, I've got newsflash schedule, mobile underscore schedule. They would just see mobile as the option. 
Also, if you're hard coding the uh, the URL into something as a link, then you would be able to use the friendly one instead of the longer name. So then the real meat where all the work happens then is the browser tab and switch theme, which the option browser-based theme switching, which if you turn on, it will use the browser of a visitor to determine which theme that they use. And then there is a list of browsers. And it goes on and on. And the beach ball is spinning it so long. So, so if we wanted anybody on Windows Mobile to keep the desktop experience, we could? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll see here, you know, if someone is visiting your site on their wonderful Microsoft Zoom, the option that's set there is default, which means whatever you have selected as your default theme will be what's served up. However, you can switch that by just going to the drop down. So now it's giving me my options. In addition to the default, we have the three enabled themes with their friendly names that I've given them in the themes tab. So mobile, newsflash, or standard. And so all I have to do for the Zoom is switch it to mobile. And once I submit at the bottom of the page, that means that Zoom people will now be getting the mobile theme rather than the standard theme, which is what the default is. But the downside of this is it means that you have to manually set every single mobile browser to the mobile theme. Uh, when I checked last night, I haven't updated this site in a long time. Android was not part of the library when I, when I originally set this site up. Um, and so Android was not in the list. So when I checked last night, Android still had, de had default next to it because I had never set anything for that. So I switched it last night. Um, they do tend to keep all of the mobile browsers together in a list, in the list, so that you probably can do it all in one fell swoop, but there's no guarantee. You really do need to look all the way down this list to find uh, what you want. They do, as I mentioned, even though the iPad and the iPod Touch and the iPhone all actually report as the same browser, they don't report the same complete agent and... Um, And so if I look for iPad, you'll see there's an option for the iPad, an option for the iPod Touch. The backup in the mobile list earlier is the iPhone. So you can actually set a different theme for all three of those. Now, I only saw one for Android, so Lee's Android tablet would probably get served up with the same theme that uh, the Android phones would get served up based upon the setting unless there's something else in this list. I want to, I'm betting there's only one Android listed. In Lee's tablet's case, we've overridden it, so we get the full desktop experience. Do you? Okay. But by default, it will, it will, show, it will use a mobile user agent. Yeah, so I mean, and, and this list is exhaustive, so uh, I don't know if anyone still actually uses the Blazor browser. That's what I had when I had a Palm Trio. Uh, still listed there. So people using a Palm Trio, still getting the mobile site. Um, so that's how you do it, is you just go through here and determine which browsers get which theme. That's all there is to it until you get into the performance issues, and I'll save that until after you show mobile tools. Mobile tools is really just as easy. We'll just leave that open so that I can get back to it. Yeah. Yeah. Are these set with uh, are these variable sets that now the question is whether you would do a variable select uh, select to be able to set these programmatically. Um, that is above my pay grade. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, surely there are ways to write a custom module that would be able to to you know tie into the hooks that are in there. I don't. I mean, I don't think that it has its own robust API of its own. But I mean, within Drupal, hopefully, you'd be able to uh, to do things. You'd, you'd have to define things. You saying yes? Yeah. You 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 would 
best way is to write your own module on the install file and just carry the set. Uh, but you know, that's just your time going through what variables are added by the tools. Or you could use features with the. Sure. So the, right. the, the question. The problem, I, I, oh, sorry. The, the question was whether or not there. Um, there's some way to select all of these um, mobile experiences and give them the same uh, definition at the same time rather than having to go through one at a time. Uh, a couple of responses, uh, probably best to write your own module. Um, you're suggesting, bless you, that the features uh, module might be using, using features with strong arm. Not necessarily do the selecting initially, but to save that. Okay, so features with strong arm to save the settings um, that you make choices for. Right, I mean, the, the, the issue comes in, you will have to keep on top of as new, as new browsers are added to the yeah. library. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I have a question because the performance um, setting on edge, not testing, uh, I'm wondering if it's possible to make it faster. The question is whether there's any benchmark uh, performance testing. Um, I don't know, but that doesn't mean that there's not. Yeah. I don't know either. We didn't. We didn't do that with the mobile theme. Um, so my 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 personal testing was basically to send out a request on Twitter that all <laughs> of my people who had mobile phones please test out this URL and see if it works and tell me what what type of phone you're using and I got back all of the major OSs with thumbs up that it was working. So that there was no performance testing involved in that. Um, so. We uh, we actually I realized I don't have these themes um, enabled. We have two mobile themes on this mobile environment that that I installed um, that we're going to talk about, which are um, mobile Garland, so I'll enable that, and Nokia Mobile, and I'll enable that and save this. Um, so I'm just going to show you mobile tools. It's really as um, basic as switch theme and browse cap mobile tools can also make use of um, of browse cap as a um, as a library and it has a more extensive browse cap has a more extensive library than mobile tools so you might actually want to use both together and, and, um, and, and, and mobile tools also can use the Warful module mm -hmm. if you want to go that route like I said neither one of us have used that so we can't really see right. how all it works yeah please. Right. W U R F L. <laughs> the question was, how do you spell Werfel? So that's W U R F L. Um, okay, so the the mobile tools um, mobile tools module. Um, the the first thing to note is that you get to choose a URL for your um, for your mobile environment. Now, this is if you're using a separate site um, for your for your mobile environment, which neither of us did, um, it is the recommended way to go. It is the better way to go, even though right. and, and I, I think that. that we probably should at some point over the next year probably do another Saturday where we talk about the method of actually having a separate site, yeah. but that's a, that's a day's worth of presentation on its own. Right, but in this case, you know, the URL would be, I would set the URL to the same as the site because the site itself is also the mobile site. Um, they're both one and the same. Um, so, but you could have different URLs. So I'll just make these match. Oops. And then, um, so are you going to automatically redirect your mobile user to a mobile version of your site? Um, chances are yes. So you can see the kind of degree of um, control that you have using mobile tools. You can um, you can set a cookie. Um, you can also accept certain pages, like if the user is coming into an admin page, um, don't send them to the mobile and uh, the mobile theme. So if they're coming from their iPhone to the admin environment, um, it's probably me. So it doesn't really matter. <laughs> but but um, you know, don't don't redirect them. Or maybe um, there's a functionality on the CAVO site to find a local league. And that functionality hasn't really been properly constructed for a mobile environment yet. So in that case, I, I'm not doing this. They are still going to a mobile environment. But I could send them to the full desktop experience on those pages. So you can make those, those choices. Um, if you're using the default front page, I, I don't. How many people actually use the default front page? I'm just curious. 
awesome. Nobody raised their hands. Um, if you happen to be using it, um, you can change the number of posts that show up. Um, that was fun. Um, <laughs> I mentioned that with mobile tools, you can actually set up different mobile roles. So what this is, is you can say, um, activate mobile roles and only activate it, like, okay, this would be a good one for, for admin, for myself. If I accidentally came into the mobile environment as an admin, maybe I could turn off things like admin menu, which looks terrible in a single column layout that doesn't have all the, yeah. Who was there the other night when I actually showed that to somebody? Nobody saw that? It was the, the mobile site with the admin menu just running through it. It was nasty. Uh, but you can do stuff like this to easily just shut off permissions to certain things in order to make modules not give you a nightmare. Um, just a, an example of why you might use it. Um, here's the fun theme switching part. Um, so use a, a theme switch. Um, you can either switch the theme based on the URL that the user comes into or based on the mobile device. Notice this little star next to switch theme for a mobile device and then it says this is not recommended uh, because of Drupal caching. Well this is the performance issue that we're going to talk about in a minute. So we're just going to ignore that and click that because that's actually the version of mobile theming that we're talking about today. Um, and then here you can say which one is your mobile theme. So in this case, uh, I'm going to use Nokia Mobile as my mobile theme. Now, by default, um, you can actually change. So iPhone will now use Nokia Mobile because that's set as the mobile theme. But I can say, you know what, if I'm coming in, if my user is coming in from an iPhone, I actually want them to get, um, I want them to get Mobile Garland. If they're coming in on an iPad, I want them to get the default theme. If they're coming in on an Android, I want them to get uh, Fusion Core. So, so you can actually um, you can actually really specify what theme they come in on, or you can um, the question you had: Can you just set them all at once? Um, this would actually enable you to do that because you are setting a default mobile theme. So then you don't have to go through and click each one. Now you will notice that there's very few uh, user agents listed here. These are the core ones that are, that are out there right now. Um, if you want access to the extensive list that Tom showed, then you would combine mobile tools and browse cap so that you're using the browse cap library. Um, and then you'll have access to all the browse cap ones in here as well. Um, and this is where you would do that in external modules, this fourth tab here, which right now it only sees mobile tools because mobile tools is the only one um, that I have enabled. But you know what? I don't have the library in here, though. So is it browse cap? Is yeah, there an E in there? Okay. Um, I, I don't know if this will work because I don't have the library in there, but it, maybe it will. Awesome. Yeah, it didn't work. But um, normally, Browse Cap would now show up as the device detection module to make use of. Um, so that's a really quick rundown of mobile tools. Just shows you how, I mean, you, you all know how to use modules. Um, so it's really not hard to do. Um, to answer your question, how quickly can this be set up? The, the longest part is going to be actually theming it. Um, so let me enable switch theme. Are those mobile themes, are they the pre-built themes that you can tweak? Is yeah. Yes. Yeah, you can sub-theme a pre-built theme. So if you're just making, if, if you're, you know, just making a quick and dirty mobile version of your site, you could just use one of those themes and not worry about, you know, how it looks at first, just to get a mobile environment up for people. Um, and that can and that can be done super super fast. Um, so let me uh, get the switch theme block going here. And you'd find those scenes just by searching for mobile themes. Yeah, there's and there's a, a I link. There's a tag uh, for mobile themes on, on if, you're, if you're if you find if you, if you go to Mobile Garland or or Nokia Mobile uh, and look at one of those. There's probably there should be a tag there. 
for mobile that would then, if you click on it, would give you a list of all the themes that have been tagged uh, as mobile. Here's the list right here. Um, so framework, adaptive theme, mobile garland, Nokia mobile, mobile. Actually, mobile I kind of like because it's really, really simple. <laughs> but uh, so if you want it to look like an iPhone GUI, um, you know, there's there's uh, there's iWebKit. I think this one might be newish. Oh no, it's not that new. Um, but I didn't see it last time I was looking. But you know, it gives you kind of a WebKit looking thing. Moby. Um, so there's lots of themes there. Um, and and we're we're planning to go into a little bit more of the innards of our themes here shortly. To talk about this, but uh, but 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 your mobile theme. Did, did you actually sub theme Nokia Mobile, or did you? I did. Yeah, and and mine was a, was a sub theme of Mobile Garland. Um, so we both just just sub themed an existing theme, um, or you could just if you're just want to get something out of the box up and running, you can just actually use one of those. Uh, Here's Mobile Garland right here. I just switched it really really quickly, um, and then where's my theme switch block? It's not on here. <laughs> um, you didn't add it to your mobile. I didn't. I need to add it. To it's the URL. It's the URL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I don't remember what the URL is. Um, okay. So what, what I'm doing, I'm in Mobile Garland. And this is actually, this is really good to show you as well. Um, because your blocks, just, I mean, you've probably all experienced this, but in different themes, you have to reset up your blocks. Uh, there are modules out there that will allow you to sync your blocks across themes, but in the case of building a mobile environment, those are counterproductive because you actually want to make use of separate blocks in your mobile environment. Um, so, where is my theme? There it is, right there. And I'll just put it in the content area for fun because it's a single column theme. Let's make sure that that actually has a region because I don't know this, yeah, okay. I, I haven't ever used this theme before, so I don't know what the regions are. <laughs> um, where are ya? Let's just go here. Where is it? Ah, uh, this thing is driving me nuts. I should not have put that on there. Okay, now we're going back to Aquia Prosper. Um, so that's really, that switch theme, that's putting in a, a theme that you pull from Drupal.org. Um, if you're not comfortable with sub-theming, you know, that's when, when we have the practical workshop um, for the rest of this afternoon, um, we'll both be here. There's other people here who are really skilled who might not actually um, sit down and, and work. Um, so there will be people here to kind of come and help you out. Um, All right, so wanna... let's talk about performance. Yeah. Before we talk about actually the theme, the theming, let's talk about performance. Um, there is a big problem with switching your theme for different users who are using a site at the same time, and that's page caching. Um, because Drup if you have page caching turned on, which is something you know for, for performance reasons you want to turn on if at all possible, the problem is is that Drupal then caches pages. Uh, and holds that cache for a while, and if you're switching a theme between different people, then say uh, say you have an anonymous person visit the desktop site, and then five minutes later, an anonymous user visits the uh, the mobile site. Um, even if you have theme switching turned on for mobile users, um, that page has already been cached by Drupal, and they won't get a new fresh page using the theme that is selected for them, they will get the cached version, which is the desktop theme. Um, so I can actually, hopefully, recreate this problem. And why is this acting like I'm... All right, so I have page caching turned on. Um, and I am going to actually... Flush my caches and and do you have another browser I can load up? Do you have Safari or something? Uh -huh. And 
once this finishes clearing the cache, all right, caches are cleared. So uh, in Safari, I am a, an anonymous user. So now I'm loading this page as an anonymous user, and I get the desktop theme. If I now were to go to my phone, and we'll see if I can actually get a page load. Hopefully I can. Um, so now even though I have theme switching turned on, uh, on this site, you won't be able to see it, but uh, I just got the desktop site on my phone, despite the fact that I have theme switching turned on. So I got what was already cached by Drupal, which is the desktop version of the site for anonymous users. Um, now for some fun. Let me, ca let me flush the caches again. And as soon as that flushes, or not, which one are we supposed to link to? No, we're on. It, you're already on. You're already on. Okay. Which one? No, but the, the caches did clear <laughs> because I now have the mobile site loading. So hopefully, maybe, since it was able to load there, now we can see what the problem this creates, which is, fingers crossed, if I refresh this, oh no, I've got the mobile site on the desktop. So the first solution is to turn off page caching, which means that Drupal no longer caches the pages, which means that there's a DB query for every single page load uh, of a page. But the plus for that is that now mobile users will get the mobile, and in theory, the uh, desktop users will get uh, desktop. That didn't fix it all for me. Uh, it fixed the front page, but in switch theme, and there's even there's an issue in, in switch theme posted uh, in the bug tracker that hasn't been fixed yet that deals with the page caching, you know, wanting to be able to use switch theme while page caching is turned on. There's discussion going on in that. There's another one that has to do with the fact that even if you turn page caching off, a lot of times only the front page is the one that gets fixed. Internal pages still have problems, which is a problem that I had uh, from the sense that, okay, they get in to the desk, to the mobile site uh, just fine, seeing the mobile theme, and as soon as they go and try to view another page uh, internal to the site, um, it's still being cached by the server itself. And so that page then loads in the desktop theme. So if they go to like an individual event page uh, on the site, uh, even though they're, they're a mobile user, they've already gotten the mobile theme, they're suddenly switched back to the desktop for that particular page, for that program page, because somebody else has loaded it recently on the um, uh, on a desktop computer. So, I solved this with what I like to call duct tape. And the reason why I say that is because the way that I solved it was I just stopped serving up actual real node views to my, uh, to my users on mobile devices. I used a completely different set of nav, uh, nav menus, which linked to argument views. So and I set up a view that uses an argument 
for the node ID that displays up this view that displays all the fields for the view, which is displaying everything in the node, but it's not actually taking them to the page that is the actual node. Does that make sense to everybody? I can clarify. It doesn't make sense. So your arc zero is not node. Uh, correct. Question was, yeah. so the arg0 is not... Is not node. node. So, no, I'm not loading, you know, schedule.tomboon.com slash node slash node ID. Or an alias of that. Right, or an alias of that. I'm actually loading a view, a dynamic view that has an argument that uses the node ID. So, um, I think, you know, I think I changed it to be like something like, you know, schedule.tomboon.com slash mobile slash node ID. And then that is taking them to the view. The view is checking that argument that's the node ID, sees what it is, and displays all the fields I've told it to display based upon uh, that argument. So, Sorry, can, can, you, can you then talk further down the theming of that view? Uh, because with, because at that point you're out of like the node dash whatever right. content type TTL file. Right, so at that point I need to actually be theming uh, the view itself which uh, can be as simple as just using CSS. The question was, you know, the, di the difference between now not using node.tpl, uh, PHP, you still need to theme it, um, but you need to theme something else. And uh, has, has anyone here used the views theming information? Anybody, has anybody not used views theming information to theme views? All right, a couple of you. Let's see if I can actually get a page load here. While he pulls that up, um, I'm going to quickly talk about another potential solution. Um, it's not as good or professional as the one that Tom has. Um, but another potential solution, if you don't have the time or, or energy or skills to do what Tom talked about, you could also, or just if you want to do it more quickly, um, you could just put up a little thing if a user comes to your site from a mobile device, give them a little, a little screen that says, you're using such and such. Um, click here for the mobile version, click here for the, um, for the desktop version. Um, Caching might still be an issue, but you can use the hard theme switch to actually send somebody over to a new theme. So that's also something to consider. All right, so I even did something um, even less complicated with this, which is for my row style, I just did node. So I was displaying the node, even though I wasn't actually taking them to the node itself. Uh, my view display exactly one item, which is, since I'm using a node ID argument, there is only one item that matches, but it's only displaying one item. Um, filters honestly didn't matter because, uh, but I, I still did the, a node type filter there anyway, but it wouldn't matter. Um, but at this point, because I'm now theming the view and not the node itself, there's a link in all, the, in all views to this theme information, which gives you a list of uh, template files, TPL files, that you can use to uh, theme the view itself. Uh, I'm actually using all the default. I didn't do any custom TPL editing for the view, but um, row style output would have to do with the actual, each individual result. So if, if I was listing five uh, different nodes, then row would be how I themed each of those individual rows. Since I have it as a node view and not a row view, uh, or not, not, and not individual fields, I don't get TPLs for the actual specific fields. Um, but if I had turned this on so that I was individually selecting which fields I wanted to display in the view, I would then give me the option of uh, individual fields and their TPLs. And by default, Views has all of these basic templates built into it. Uh, the ones that are bold are, the, are actually all defaults, the first one listed. But you'll see it tells me on row style output, let's see if I can get this bigger so you can actually read it as I 
I'm looking at it. Is that better? Any better? Yeah. All right, so the template that it's currently using to, to theme the row is views-view-row-node.tpl.php, which is a TPL file that's actually sitting in the views module. Um, I could, however, override that TPL by in my theme that I'm using for the mobile site, um, adding individual TPL files that have any of these other names. And actually, you see here in this, this is in the, in the views module, in the theme folder, are all of these default views TPLs. So we've got individual fields, individual rows, RSS, summary, all of these different TPLs can be overridden in your theme folder, in your custom theme folder. So to do that, you would just take that particular TPL and then copy it over into your theme. Just uh, drop it there. And then just make sure that it's named properly. Um, so if you wanted to be more specific in the file name, in order to specify what it's actually, you know, if it's just going to impact the mobile uh, view as opposed to any other view. Right now, the way that I put it in there, it'll impact all views. So you can actually use these names to be more right. specific. You can actually use, so say for example, I only wanted to retheme the row style output for this view. Um, and since I'm using the, the default, it gives me the option of the, 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 the most specific one I have here is views-view-row-node dash dash mobile, which, I, which is the uh, dash dash mobile dash node, which is the view name. Um, so that is actually creating a TPL file, or if I had to name this, that TPL file would only affect row style output for this view, mobile dash node, and only the default display. So this theme actually uses um, a, uh, a page display for what's actually output on the site. And you wouldn't necessarily even need to theme that, correct? Because it would just show the, the page because you're right. pulling in the node right. format. So you don't actually need to go through it. Right, but, but you see here is that now that I've switched to the page display, the most specific one is actually page dash one, because that's the identifier for this particular display. It's the page is the name, and it's the first one listed as page. So that's the specific identifier. So if I were to put that TPL in my theme folder, that would control the output. And if, say, for example, you're in a hosting environment, I've been in hosting environments where I only had access to the modules folder and the theme folder, that was it. I didn't have access to the actual contrib modules that were actually already built into the site. Um, and didn't have access to the code base itself. So if, say for example, all you have access to is uh, just your themes, and you wanted to add that TPL but didn't have access to that default in the file system for Drupal, if you actually click on the one that you want to override, it will give you the actual code for that default TPL. You copy that, and uh, paste it into a file, and save it with whatever name you want to give it to override it, put it in your theme, you now have a custom TPL for your theme for that particular field or row or view or whatever it is you're overriding. And it'll override the TPL file in the views module because it'll look in your theme for one first. And then right, and, and, and all, of those, uh, all of those TPLs by default basically just say, um, you know, to, to display output, because output is defined uh, by views. But then you have access to other variables that you can change around what exactly it is that output includes. And actually this one, because I'm using node view, it just says print node, and if there's comments, print comments. But uh, 
I can override this and tell it to display specific fields or change around the order they display if they're viewed in this in this way. Uh, I can do anything that I could with any TPL. How do you resolve uh, images? Um, well, since it's a different view. The, the, the question is how do you deal with images that might be too big for a mobile device? And, and I guess in the instance that you're showing um, with this with this view, you, you since you're using the node view, it might not work. But if you if you were using field views, you could just choose a different so you image cache a, setting. A separate uh, field for every mobile No, device. just a different image cache setting. Um, if you use the fields, if, if instead of node you used fields yeah, for your view, um, then then you could just in the when you display the field in the view in the image field, just use a different image cache setting than your right. than your standard one so that it's properly sized for the mobile environment. Yeah. I was going to add another way to do that would be to if, if you've used Devel and the DPM function, you can look through the array of the node to see what image cache settings you have. And then you can print that out actually into that mm -hmm. custom mm -hmm. note. So you see on file that you wrote. Um, so a great answer was around. just given, and um, correct me if I say anything incorrect here. Um, but a great answer was just given, which is you could also use Devel and the um, and use that to look through the image cache settings that you have, and then actually custom theme the image cache setting that would be good for a mobile environment. So, uh, I think more precisely, instead of print contents in the notes TPL file. You're actually printing out the node, whatever that object is, excuse me, the node object and whatever your image cache setting is right there in the TPL. So instead of print content, it would be print node and then the object that you're trying to put into the TPL file. I'm just repeating it for this, yeah. Oh, why not? Let's, let's talk about one more way. You, you could also use display suite and, uh, and create a new build <laughs> mode for, uh, for like, so you could, you could still stick to the, to using the, the node row style in the view, but then just instead of using the regular full node build mode, you can use a build mode that you create that, that lets, and then through that, you can select um, mm -hmm. stuff with your images to switch things in your cache. That's your so you can also use display suite, and instead of using the full build mode, you can use a build mode to display the images that you want to display. Um, yeah? All, all of these, all they really work with the images are, are their own. Right. Yes, uh, yes, thank you, Oliver. This is a problem if you try to insert the images or call the images from an external source within the node. Yeah. So Oliver just reminded us that these solutions only work if the images are their own CCK field. Um, if the images are in line, then um, there might be something in the article from Alista Part about responsive web design that might help solve that problem for inline images. So that's worth um, worth looking at as well. Um, so we should um, we should probably wrap up and let people have lunch, and then we can come back and play. Um, we should also open up for questions, but before I do so, is there anything else that you wanted to add? Uh, I would just uh, say, we haven't really talked about, oddly, in, in a presentation that's all about switching mm -hmm. themes and using mobile themes, we really haven't talked about the nuts and bolts of how to theme something, because you theme it exactly the same way that you would theme your regular site. Um, if, uh, and like I said, well, both of us, for our solution, we use a sub-theme. Uh, of an existing contrib theme. Uh, is there anybody here who has never done a sub theme? Doesn't know how that's accomplished. All right, so okay, we, a couple people in the back there. Um, so it's not hard. Basically, at its, at its most basic, all you have to do is create uh, a .info file, mm -hmm. and that's it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if, if, if the, the mobile world is changing so quickly. And the, the, so the question was, why yeah. is there is there an advantage over using a sub theme as opposed to just starting with a base theme and building a base theme itself? And um, well, the mobile world is changing. This is this is my assumption as to what the advantage would be. 
since the mobile world is changing so quickly, there's functionality that um, I, I don't know that any of us can really keep up with. And these contrib themes do a much better job than you as an individual can because there's a lot of people talking. So to just be able to upgrade your theme um, when new stuff is added to the theme based on what new functionality is out there in the mobile world um, just gives you an advantage, especially if your client doesn't have a lot of money for long-term maintenance. Um, and wants to be able to stay up to date. It's just easier to be able to replace your your original base theme quickly with um, with something else that's contributed. Right. I mean, and, 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 um, a non-mobile example of sort of the of this advantage is that um, I was using for multiple sites as a base theme something called Newswire, um, and then creating sub themes uh, where I was just you know making all kinds of changes to it but still had that basic framework of what Newswire did. Newswire, for its latest version, actually became a Fusion and Skinner-based theme. And so now, by upgrading my base theme, Newswire, to its new to newest version, um, I didn't have to do anything, really, to my sub-theme to turn it into a Fusion Skinner theme, um, which means now I have all of that grid stuff and uh, all the Fusion uh, options uh, in the in the theme configuration uh, that I probably never would have gotten around to building into my own theme, just because I'm lazy. Yeah. Uh, when you were talking about creating a, a sub theme, you, you guys didn't mention that you, you have to refer to the. So when you yes. when you use your that info file, you need to refer to the base theme. Right. Can, um, can you just pull up your? Do you have that? Do you have that stored locally that you can pull up the dot info file for your sub theme? No, I, I actually didn't do that for this particular one. Um, Zen. But Zen does, yeah, we can use Zen's. Prosper does use Fusion. Yes, yeah, so if you go look at Prosper, the .info file will have the... Where are you? Where's the, the, info the very top file? Of Acquia, Prosper. Thank you, right up at the top. Look at the top. Hmm. Sorry. So at its base, then, um, all you really have to do is sort of give, give your theme a name, um, whatever, you know, an engine, you know, for, and then this base theme definition there tells, it, uh, tells Drupal what to use as the base theme for your theme. So now when, when Acquia Prosper is selected uh, in your site as the theme, it's actually using anything that's in Acquia Prosper, but it's also using anything in Fusion Core that Acquia Prosper hasn't overridden. So at its, at its most basic level, you can have a sub-theme that all you do is create this .info file with a name, base theme, engine, and then you now have a sub-theme. Uh, but your sub-theme doesn't actually do anything different than what the base theme does at this point. But you start adding in TPL files, CSS files, different regions defined in your .info file, then you can start completely overriding what's in your base theme, but still keep the things about the base theme that you want to keep. So, that, so, so when in, in the mobile environment then, you start with something like Mobile Garland or Nokia Mobile, then you get out of the box everything that comes with those themes, and then you can only override those things that you want to override uh, in your sub theme. And for me, because I was having to get this thing put together in one weekend, basically in one 36 hour marathon session, it saved me a lot of time just to start with Mobile Garland rather than trying to build something from scratch. Um, I, I liked when Tom and I were putting together the outline for this talk, Tom actually said it best, just sub-theme for Christ's sakes. <laughs> It'll save you so much time. Yeah, I mean, um. th that doesn't mean that, you know, once, once you know, if you're a professional, people yeah. expect to, for you to be providing them, you know, clients with a theme. Maybe sub-theming isn't necessarily the way to go. But when I'm throwing up a site that I'm hosting myself, that I'm doing, you know, providing as a service to other people, um, and I'm the only one dealing with it, I'm the only one theming it, I'm the only one configuring it, there's no reason not to do a sub theme. And I mean, yeah. that's the reason why you can sub theme is because it's a convenience and uh, 
it's built into Drupal to be able to do that. Yeah, if your client can only afford, you know, five or ten hours of your time, then use a sub theme. Make it something that you can do in five or ten hours. So that's, uh, or if your client's yourself and, and you want to go play with your dog in the evening. <laughs> Oliver? Just the note, like, for the for the technique for overriding the stuff, you, you would grab some uh, CSS selectors from the base theme style, mm -hmm. copy it into your 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 style sheet for the sub theme, and then just make your changes there. So you're basically grabbing a copy of what was in the base theme and overriding your custom. Yeah, so Oliver's pointing out that when you are sub-theming, uh, what you do is you grab the files, the CSS file or the template file from your base theme and then copy it into your sub-theme and then um, make sure it has the same name and then you are literally overriding what's in the base theme. Delete anything from, like for a CSS file, if you don't want to edit any CSS classes that are in that original base theme CSS file, delete them from it so that it's not actually overriding, so that you, you're not creating excess overrides. Um, you don't need to duplicate that stuff. Um, yeah? I just want to say it's, it's much simpler just to make a local file every time that you change some of yeah. CSS, put that in to find your file. Which is actually what Acquia Prosper does. Um, Acquia Prosper has a local sample that comes with the install, and then you just rename that to local.css, and then you'll put any of your custom theming. Um, oh, I guess I did more theming than I thought. Um, <laughs> you put any of your custom theming. Right, and, and, and a big in reason, there. If, if you get into the whole fusion uh, theming and sub theming, um, had they fixed the sub theming issue? Because of course the way that it did it, it was working was you couldn't do a sub theme of a fusion based theme. So not yet. You, can, it, you, you still, still can. can't. So mm -hmm. say you want to use Aquia Prosper. Aquia Prosper is already a sub theme because its base theme is Fusion Core. You can't then create a sub theme of a Fusion Core sub theme. So I can't create a sub theme of Aquia Prosper. If I want to use Aquia Prosper as my base theme, I have to hack Aquia Prosper. Or and you create what this what they what they've set system. up to allow you to do that that hacking in a safe way is to create this local.css file, um, which it will then read those changes. But you keep all of your changes in the local.css file, um, and then when you upgrade, if there's an update to Aquia Prosper, it doesn't override and erase all of the changes that you've made. Now you start start customizing and hacking the TPLs in Aquia Prosper, then you're going to get kind of messy when you uh, do upgrade that. So are there when when we come back from we're we're going to let you go for lunch. When we come back from lunch, we have these um, flash disks that have this lovely mobile site on them and um, and the proper modules, and you can just start playing with it. We'll get the flash. We'll get the site out to all of you. If you have your own site that you would like to work on, such as the sand count site, um, you're welcome to do that. At um, your own risk. At your own risk. <laughs> the other thing that you're welcome to do, this time coming up is your time. So if you'd like to team up with people and work together, um, you know, you can you can do that. We you can come around the tables, we'll clean this up. Um, there are a couple people who've never um, created a sub theme before. You guys might want to team up and and um, let's just say you'll come up to this area to work. If you're if you're very new to theming, come up here, and then um, we'll kind of we'll be making our way around the room, but we'll also spend some time with you helping you get your theme set up. Um, the site that we have to give out to you on these uh, discs actually. Um, Includes mobile tools, switch theme, um, browse cap, mobile garland, and Nokia mobile. Um, so if you can't get online, you have everything you need to work on everything we've been talking about today. But the, the, just just in case you were hoping that this was like a, a Drupal site on a stick that you can basically plug in and go, you have to actually you have to set up your your database. Yeah. So if you don't have, who doesn't have a local working environment set up? Okay, those people who don't have a local working environment set up, you might want to also work together and uh, maybe come over here and um, we'll help you get set up as well. If you have your own working environment set up, you can, if the database is in, site's uh, default, 
files yeah, backup if, migrate. If, yeah, if, if you just and turn on, is, is it a backup migrate file so that they would use the backup migrate module? Yeah. 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 yeah, you can, well, but they have to have something. That's true. So you'll, you'll have to install the database because there's no install.php file. Yeah, yeah, it has, it, it has the entire um, mobile, lovely mobile site. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see you here at 2? Sounds good. 2, 2.30? 2. Cristofano? 2. 2. Let's say 2. <laughs> no other questions? No? All right. We'll, we'll give you more time for questions when you come back, just in case. You said you use different menus. Yeah. Blocks for, so you define, define those menus you use only on a particular theme? Yes. Yeah. So I, I, I'm going to yeah, actually... Yeah, because they're blocks. Ask him real quick. Show so him. The, the so blocks are blocks. not theme on individuals. Uh, yeah, you can you can put your blocks. You can set up your blocks separately for theme. No, using your yeah. block menu. Yeah. Um, so here in my in my list of blocks. So here I'm in the in the desktop theme, and I have all these different you know secondary links. Um, primary oh, so you're not activating top. them on, the, on another Right. Theme. So now over in my mobile version of the theme. I have completely different blocks. Okay. So then your, your menu can go into a separate view that you created automatically. And then you just... I have a question. Um, yeah. yeah. So mobile home is just that menu that shows up on the front page. I just want to show him how to do it. So rabbit? essentially I can create yeah. it all in the view. Oh, he's getting a rabbit. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and it's um, impossible. I think that that's probably it, but you're that mobile, mobile home. If it's not a menu, you could just create another, another menu. Yeah. That the only time that you actually use it on your site is as a block yeah. uh, in the mobile uh, okay. block. I'm going to ask you any uh, plans on turning your thing into a distribution? Uh, no, I uh, the work I did on it to get it get all my modules updated and get everything set up for today was the first work I've done on it in a year and a half. Uh, uh, it was a one year thing. So, so and from Node autocomplete, uh, that is that's gone bye bye, okay. um, and uh, it's actually a security hole that I still have it uh, mm -hmm. installed. There is an there's another module. That they say to use instead, but I've yeah. never gotten around to setting it up. I put I installed it on the site, and then it was like a week later they say, "Oh, by the way, this module is no longer being supported." Well, and which I have no idea how how good the replacement is, but theming the yeah. uh, but, but, but theming the old that? module no, was I such a horrendous pain in the ass yeah. that I can't imagine <laughs> that it's a bad thing. Well, yeah, that, have a good that, that it's been cool replaced. Yeah, I haven't organized. It seems like it's thing just thing easier to to build it yourself. Just use the jQuery and everything to make it just an auto complete. Sounds like you understand. I totally understand. Yeah, I'd be interested in helping you with that if that is something that you're wanting to do. I don't know. It depends on whether I decide that I want to do this again this, uh, in, in 2011. I was thinking about either yeah doing it for other for, you know, other things as well. That's a lot of work. That just seems like a, such a great idea. That puts the conversation in such a pain in the ass. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, essentially, a, at its base level, going what going I'm doing is no so. different well, than what sked.org does. But sked.org. I don't necessarily like exactly the way that they implement everything, um, and you can't add personal events on on theirs. But um, I, I'd be particularly if I wanted to monetize it, which I probably wouldn't. But I I'm hesitant to do much more than just do it for myself for my own use because of how similar it is to Skype.org. So. Okay. Hi. Hi. Do you have a business card? Yeah. Um, hello. It's me. It's me too. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Not a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, we don't have a chat. Um, yeah. No, no, no. I don't think it's a good one. I don't think it's great. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's it. Uh, we have a chat. Okay. Good. It's just.
Are you open to emails? Yeah. Yeah. It's you know, we're working on a project or whatever. Or yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. yeah, we're going to go to. Uh, I, I wasn't here when all of a sudden everyone left. So there's, there's no such a plan. But uh, there's a food court on 30th Broadway. Yeah. So and I have I not neglected go work. working on my Drupal stuff for man, over a year. And I thought I had man on this laptop, but maybe I—I I don't think I would have deleted. So maybe I never installed it on here. I'm working on a G5 at home, which is weird. Um, I think there might have been a reason why I didn't download man on this computer. So is there? I mean, would it work on this, or did I do that because I checked? I don't know because uh, for all my local stuff, I use the Aquian Drupal stack installer. And uh, which is what I would recommend is the easiest way to get a site up. You know, at the, that yeah, site yeah, right? right? No, it's free. Uh huh. Um, and it installs, it, it ignores the PHP and oh, Apache and MySQL that are installed up on, uh, on, on your OS, mm -hmm. Mac OS, and it uses its own stack of PHP and MySQL. Uh,